you know, being put out by a publisher that was, like, not the best. They were, you know, they just were kind of trying to cash in, I think. And now the, the books have kind of returned to the, uh, the family. The, the Raw Trust now owns the rights to most of his books. And so they're putting them out in a way that is more legit. And so so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, like, learn from my mistakes before and kind of, like, drum it up a bit. Um, so th th this is something I came up with uh, for Hilaritas Press um, when this book came out, the raw art book. They kind of wanted me to do like like an origin story of like how I'm connected to all this. So I'm gonna just kind of I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but just like a quick overview of how I got sucked into this world because like I wasn't I I did not go looking for this stuff. Like I, it was never my intention to get into philosophy or psychology or, you know, neuro-linguistic programming or magic or, you know, meta-contextual studies, none of it. I was, you know, I, my plan was to work at my brother's auto repair shop, watch the hockey on TV, and not wonder about anything at all. I was, you know, I was a know-nothing slacker, and that is fine with me. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, I, my, the first half of my childhood was really chaotic. Um, my mom was schizophrenic, and my dad was, like, high up in a, like, uh, motorcycle gang. Like, he was, like, involved in, like, you know, drug dealing and violence. And wow. So, like, I sort of grew up in a very chaotic environment. And so when I was 12... Um, my dad went to jail and my mom died and so I went to live with my older brother my older brother took care of me and so there was it was like night and day so far as like uh, disorder to order I like when I was when I after I was 12 I had sort of like a sitcom normal life and so I was hesitant to like start opening up those jars of mayonnaise in the back of my head you know because there was uh, some of it had spoiled you know? <laughs> and so I was very I, I was not you know I read Alan Moore comics I liked Bill Hicks like that sort of like entertainment level um, occultism was about as deep as I would go but otherwise I was you know not looking like I cheated my way through high school like I didn't learn anything in high school I was doing the same thing in college I was it was the full like Generation X slacker thing and then something happened. <laughs> I fell straight into, you know, what you would call the dark night of the soul. I, one night, I, we were having a huge party at my house. We had one of those, like, punk rock party houses. And, you know, this, we, we would have bands play. We would put flyers around town. Like, we just would open the doors and whatever happened, happened. So there was, like, maybe, like, 150 people at the house. And, uh... On the way home that night, I had, there had been uh, a tractor trailer stuck in the middle of the road. So I'm just driving, going about 90 miles an hour. The car in front of me peels out in front, and I'm barreling straight into the back of this stopped car. Swerve out of the way, miss it by that much, go home. The party's already started. Drink, smoke, boom. And I fell into a burning ring of fire. <laughs> and it burned, burned, burned. Like I, and nothing in my life had prepared me for that mode of perception. I disassociated from individuality. I lost any sense of being who I was, where I was. That, and, and, you know, now these things are, sl like, slightly... There's a, there's a shorthand for it. I, I, I can talk about uh, Nietzsche's eternal recurrence. And that's something you, you, you'll nod along to. You know what that is. Or even like on an HBO show like True Detective, time is a flat circle. Mm -hmm. That's what I fell into. I lost any sense of who I was, where I was, or what was going on. And it was... Um, the experience was there was no time, there was no space, and everything hurt. It was the first noble truth of Buddhism, you know, like dukkha, all is suffering. And I then woke up the next day and everything was back to normal. It was like I got scooped up, brought to this place that I had no 
preparation for even knowing that it existed, and then landed right back uh, in my bedroom, everything back to normal. So obviously I was like, well, I'm crazy now. <laughs> uh, you know, it, like I said, like I, my mom was schizophrenic. I was like, you know, it came and got me. There I am. It's a, you know, it, that's a wrap for me. Um, but it actually it it, it had, um, jarred loose a memory of this has happened actually once before when I was little. Um, I had when I was eleven. I was spending the night at my uh, grandmom's house, and my uncle had cooked me, like, you know, I hadn't eaten all day, and he was like, I'll just grab something out of the freezer. And he cooked, like, a whole box of Jimmy Dean sausage that was, like, freezer burn. I didn't care. I was hungry. And so I got food poisoning. And so I was in the full thrall of, like, you know that, like, and, like, little kid food poisoning. So, like, I don't even know what's happening. Am I okay? And as I'm throwing up, I get a phone call. And it's, my mom's been in an accident, and she's probably going to die. Oh, my God. So it, mental and physical, and I lost the boundaries of what hurt my mind and what hurt my body. And so I defaulted to hell. What I had been told what hell was as a boy. So I experienced hell as if it was a real thing. And then, again, woke up in the morning, she didn't die, back to earth, everything normal, and I just sort of shoved that away until that opened it back up. So I sort of didn't, you know, I didn't really have the, like, intellectual tools to, you know, deconstruct any of this. But, like, I was, um, you know, that was in the summer, and then uh, I was, at this point, I was going to the University of Delaware, and one of my classes was an Indian religion and philosophy class. And the professor, you know, first day in, starts talking about samsara. Samsara, the endless, you know, it's kind of interesting. We, 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 we speak of, like, um, reincarnation as if it's a good thing. But, like, in Eastern philosophy, it's their version of hell. Like, that's, like, the thing that you're trying to escape. And so this idea that there was this endless cycle of suffering, rebirth, that, like, transcended time. I was like, I've seen it. I know that. And it made me feel so much better. I was like, someone else has seen this before. This is out there somewhere. I'm not the only one that has seen this. And so I started reading everything. Every, because I, I, it was out there. There was a trail. I was like, you know, th that's when you become the seeker, right? When, you, when you're looking for, you know, the, the mystery that's beyond ordinary experience so I uh, found Crawley first and then Leary and McKenna and Lily and I danced around Mr. Wilson there and then the the same professor um, was a Raw fan and my first encounter with Raw was in that same Indian religion and philosophy class it was a handout that was Patanjali's eight limbs of yoga compared with the eight circuit model so that was my first you know encounter with Raw but I, I sort of it, you know I was like oh that's interesting um, but then um, my roommate had gone to talk to the professor and he gave him a copy of Illuminatus and um, at my friend read it and one day I came home and it was sitting next to my bed picked it up read the first couple of pages and read the whole thing in about two days it just like dragged me through I was like because it was it was this feeling of coming home because like especially being that I wasn't like an academic kid that there were there were certain things that I bounced off of that like Raw presents in that like I'm a guy from Brooklyn in the 30s I'm gonna I'm gonna talk to you like a plumber about how this stuff works and that you know like Bertrand Russell I, it's great stuff but it's just presented in a way that I bounce off of I don't I don't trust that kind of like it's there's trappings to that that I don't trust it, it you know I grew up shit eating poor and like if someone comes to me with a tweed jacket and I'm like where'd you get that <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when Raw kind of like presented a lot of stuff in that like working class way that I didn't distrust um, so I kind of became like obsessed with this guy who could speak my language and was like presenting things in a way that was helpful and all of a sudden my world wasn't scary anymore it was awesome all of a sudden like, and, and this is actually, I, I think this is like an underrated thing about Raw that makes him so useful, is that, so that's Chapel Perilous. Chapel Perilous is like a way to recapture 
psychotic experiences in a way that doesn't disqualify you from being a successful person. It's like a part, you know what I mean? Like instead of this being this thing that means I'm going to be homeless and destitute and all that, it's a part of a larger journey that's leading somewhere that's, that can be awesome. So that's sort of, that's the path. That's how I took it. I thought I, instead of it being this thing that was me unraveling, um, it was an initiation into a larger world. And so what was great about the University of Delaware is they had everything he wrote in the library. Everything. I just I would just go and I'll just get the next one and be like, this is great. They had all the like, um, all the like, you know, uh, true synthesis or sound photosynthesis videos down the like media yeah. thing. So I could, like, I was just able to pour through all this stuff. And I remember like, at one point I was reading, I think it was, it was probably Prometheus Rising. And I just got mad because like I was having, you know, it, Throughout all this, you know, I was I was young. I was, you know, like 21. And I was having all these crazy experiences. Of, like, synchronicity was just everywhere. Everything, like, like I would, I, you know, we didn't have internet at the house. So I would just print out all these things off the internet and bring it home and read it. And, like, I would get these, like, crazy magic, magic rituals that were, like, things I would never actually want to do. I remember I had this one thing where it was, like, what you should do is you go to a cabin in the woods with a dead deer and you just sit with the dead deer and you stare at it and you watch how you know like the, the, the thing they were going for was fine but that's I would never do that so but you're supposed to like watch the dead animal and then like see how like the as it decomposes that's actually new life inhabiting that physical space so it's like it's the bit about like transformation instead of annihilation and that's fine so I'm reading that and I'm like I'm never doing that my cat walks by with a dead mouse in his mouth, and he <laughs> drops it right in the middle. And it was you, asshole! Like, 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 that's not fair. That's not fair. To put, like I hit the zenith of where I found my line, and I was like, "That's too far for me." And it just like the the universe like winked at me and was like, "Well, you still got to deal with this." Um, so yeah, so things were, like that were happening all the time. And if you're looking for coincidences, obviously you can find them. And I was good at looking for them. So I actually got mad at Robert Anton Wilson because he wasn't he wasn't there. Like he, I, I I was having all these experiences, and he was out there somewhere in the world, but I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't be like, "Why are things this way?" Why am I experiencing these things? And I got mad. And then got mad. I got mad. I got angry at him for not being there, which is, I would tell you, I understand now that that's absurd. I was, you know, stoned and like, you know, <laughs> young. But I actually got mad at him for not being around. And then cut to two years later, I'm sitting in his living room, smoking a joint, and we're watching a Frankenstein movie. And so, like, I. <laughs> You know, for the, the distance in, in, in the lived experience of being in that moment of being mad at him for not being around and then sitting in his living room able to, like, tell him everything that happened to me and all this, you know, the lived experience is that's a long journey. That, you, you know, the years from 21 to 23 when you live them are a long time, but I'm 37 now, almost 38, and it's a smash cut in my memory. <laughs> I might as well have teleported from that moment of anger to his living room. <laughs> so it was, there's all these things where it's like, I have these moments where they're like, objectively I'm being crazy, and then it like happens. <laughs> like I remember one time, like around that same time, I was like, um, I became, you know, we would all smoke before bed, and then, um, and I was still, you know, when you're new at smoking weed and it still like tosses you out. I would get, you know, and, and so I, and I, and I could, I can never fall asleep in those moments. Like I gotta, I gotta, I gotta ride that wave until it crashes. So I would um, write my comic books in bed before I could, I'd fall asleep. And one time I became convinced that I was a, a comic book character, that I wasn't an actual person. I was a comic book character. And then years later, I made a comic book about that experience. So it's like that's a crazy thing to think that you're a comic book character. But I'm not wrong. I am. <laughs> I'll sell you. <laughs> so yeah. So um, so I went through sort of like a training montage uh, experience where I read everything. Like I did the pranayama. I did you know the stretching exercises. 
I, I even did the thing where you go to the, the Amazon and drink ayahuasca with the shaman. And, um, and like, just, it was amazing. It was, like, this, uh, the complete opposite of the experience that started the journey. It was, it, you know, I started from this really low place, and then that became the impetus for this awesome adventure. And I remember, so, like, you know, when I went to the Amazon, I the, the comics there somewhere where... Uh, it, it, it's not the whole story, but it's just part of it. Um, so I had this big old experience. Like, I'm wandering around the Amazon jungle by myself. Like, uh, completely, like, out of... Not even out of my mind, because it was actually, like, really... Um, it was, like, medicine. It was, like, taking medicine. Um, and so I go and I sit and I have, you know, reflecting on everything that I've seen. And, you know, I was completely out of my body and out of anything I recognize as the real world. And then I realized that, that it was the, the next week was when the maybe logic classes were starting. That's when I was going to like get to start in, interacting with him. Um, cause that, that's how it started. So he, um, you know, he, his post polio symptoms, um, came back as he got older and he wasn't able to like travel and uh, do lectures anymore. So what he did was, instead of him going out to the world, he brought the world to him. So he opened up this, it, this website called the Maybe Logic Academy, where he would do these classes. And so, um, you know, they had this special offer. It's like if you're one of the first 10 people that sign up, you could get email uh, access with them. So that's what I did, and I signed up for it. And um, so that's how I was able to email with them. And the best thing about those classes, so, you know, they were a lot of... The initial ones he did were like 12 weeks long. After the first three weeks, it was like a go. There was like 10 people there, and you could like talk to them all you wanted. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, that so then after I got back from the Amazon is when the maybe logic thing started, and thank God it did because again, I, so now I had had the opposite experience of the Chapel P Perilous thing. I had had the simulation of like transcendent enlightenment, which is just as unhealthy, <laughs> you know, going forward, you know? Like, so, so I was so hyperactive and like, so I was bursting with energy and I had him to like help reintegrate that experience into back to being balanced. Just like his books, it helped me bring me up. This, having access to him as a real person, brought me back down. So I had been too far down, I went too far up. He helped me find the middle. And I think that's, a, that's another like interesting thing about his work, is that he functions as, he, he can help pull you back in if that's what you need, and he can also help cast you out if that you need, if that's what you need. And you and you meet the different people that find him in the different ways. Some people need to break out, and some people need to pull themselves back in. And he is uh, actually pretty good for both of them. Um, so the maybe logic thing went on, I guess, for about three to four years. Um, there was an interesting thing in the in the tale of the tribe class, um, which was. Um, the book that he never finished that like I think I think someday like everyone who is familiar with that material is going to help put it together um, but we ended up in the hospital on the same day he and I so he he collapsed you, you know the story about when he collapsed when he's older and Christina has to break down the door and she so that the same time that that happened I was in a car accident and broke my hip in four I broke my arm, and so it was, it was crazy. So I, I, like, I remember logging back into the class, and he was like, I'm in the hospital. I was like, I was just in the hospital. And it was like this weird thing that, like, it, it you know, this crazy process uh, had entangled us in this way, at least from my perspective. It, and, and that's sort of, like, the interesting thing about the experience of studying with him is from my perspective he was Dumbledore and I was Harry Potter, you know, because that's how, from, you know, first person perspective. And from his perspective, I understood that I was just another, like, you know, uh, person clamoring for his attention. But he was able to, like, still 
he he played his side of the chessboard as if he I, I had his full attention, but I knew that he was like Bobby Fischer playing chess with twenty different people. One of my favorite things, and uh, the the source material for the talk I'm doing tomorrow, the Eight Dimensions of Mind. I remember I, I posted this like my uh, interpretation of the Eight Circuit Model across like in a thread with two posts of all my ideas, and then there was a bunch of people like reacting to it, being like, "Oh, that's pretty. Oh, I like that. That's pretty good." And then his response was, "This thread contains two of the most brilliant posts from an unusually brilliant group." But notice he doesn't specify the brilliance as belonging to me, right? Because I was 23. If Robert Anton Wilson had told me I was brilliant when I was 23, it would have fucked me up. I would have been like, you wouldn't, no one could have told me anything. So, but, but also, if I hadn't been encouraged, I would have, you know, probably like, well, well, maybe this isn't for me. And, you know, so he threaded the needle between like, you know, praising me too much and not praising me enough in a way that was really impressive for him to know that he had to phrase it that way. Um, otherwise, I think it would have been bad for me. Um, so, right, so, uh, and then, this is, the first time I read The Earth Will Shake, uh, which is the first in the historical Illuminatus chronicles that I just re illustrated so the first time I read it was in a quantum psychology class. And it was, so the cool thing about that book is that it's about a, a young uh, artist learning from an older, uh, not necessarily artist, but adept um, craftsman, um, how to do this stuff. And so the, the metaphor was pretty exact. And so you're reading this book, and it's, you know, you, Uncle Pietro is, is the main uh, character that guides the younger character, Sigismundo, through this initiation experience. And so I'm reading this book while having the author to be like, hey, what about this? What do you think? Hey, I like this part. What you, is, you know, and, and it was awesome. It was this very interesting way to read a book where you're actually like, able to inhabit the world in a way um and so like there was a part where i was also i would you know when i draw i a lot of times i listen to books on tape so as i'm reading the earth will shake i'm listening to portrait of the artist as a young man and pretty much like a day or two apart i hit the exact same scene in both books where it's like the the, the young Catholic kid gets indoctrinated into uh, the dogma of what hell is like, which, if you remember, is this thing I actually experienced once when I was little. And so that was, like, a thing that stuck out. I was like, holy shit, like, that, that's, like, a big part of my life. And I just, like, hit the... And so I was able to ask him, like, is that intentional? And he was able to be like, yeah, that... And, and here's a couple other things. And so, like, so it was a neat way to, like interact with a, a novel. It was like meta-contextual beyond what you would normally get from metafiction. It, it reached out into the real world. I'm to the point, like, so I was young and he was drunk and I was like, can I, can I use your character Simon Moon for my comic series, Echnosis? And he was just like, sure, have fun. Like, you know, they, um, and so uh, I, 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 I I felt bad about it afterwards because, like, you know, like, I was being rude. I would, th that's, like, not something I should have done. Um, so what I did was I made a different character that was slightly based on um, the... I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's spelled like it's mud hen, um, but it's, like, a, you know, one of those Irish spellings, so I don't know if it's actually pronounced moon. So I, so I gave him uh, the last name uh, from... Uh, the widow's son of his ancestor. So it's Simon M Mud Mahoon. Mahoon. Okay, that, there we go. Um, so it, it was my way of being like, I'm going to take a character inspired by without actually stealing your character. Um, so then um, towards the end of his life, um, I actually started to, to get to do some artwork for him. Um, they, he asked me to do a, uh, a book plate for his library. Um, so like that was like one of the... like as. Uh, he was in like hospice care like that's one of the things that they were doing to pass the time was cataloging his library so I got to you know this was the first thing I ever got to do for him and specifically at his request and then when he got really sick um, there was a fundraising effort 
And so what we did was we made uh, bio survival tickets. We made his own currency. And so we printed them and then he signed them and sold them on eBay. And they all sold and they like for like a hundred dollars a pop. Like it, they made like real money. And uh, so yeah, so those are the first, those were the, the things I got to do for him while he was alive. Um, and then he uh, passed away. Um, I, I drew this, like, so I was at work, I saw that he died, I came home, and I drew this. Uh, I, I re, like, the version you're seeing here, I, like, re-inked and, like, made it high def, but it's still all the same design. Um, and then, so they had an event uh, in Santa Cruz called the Raw Memorial, meme Oriole, you know. And uh, so I drew, I drew this for that. And um, his daughter ended up emailing me, being like, hey, I really like that. Can I use that to promote the event and all? And so that ended up getting printed in the Santa Cruz Metro. Um, and so I, I, got, I went out to the event, and craziest thing. So um, Christina's do, doing the speech um, at the memorial, essentially his eulogy, and like singles out Douglas Rushkoff and me for thanks. So, like, Douglas Rushkoff isn't there. I'm there. So she has me stand up, and people applaud. But, like, I didn't really do anything. Like, it was, like, this weird, like, misunderstanding. Like, I didn't, like, all, I, I drew that, and I did, like, it wasn't, it was just, like, a thing that happened. But, like, mind you, remember, I'm, I was, two years ago, I'm in my room mad because I can't meet this person, and now I'm at his funeral being applauded by his friends. Like, what the fuck is going on? Like, it's so bizarre. Um, and, and so then I, later I would see that someone else did, like, a flyer for that event that was, like, professional and, like, really good and way better than my mind's, like, something I just, like, drew real quick. And so, like, mine's the one that gets used, even though it's not even that good. Um, and it's just, like, this experience of being tangled up with your favorite author and not really understanding why it's happening. Like, this is, like... I, I could understand how, like, this could be interpreted as, like, a big humble brag, but it's more just, like, this is my experience and I don't understand it. So, like, part of what I've been doing is, like, going out and... Find, like actually meeting the people in real in the real world because for me a lot of this happens with me alone in my studio and like it doesn't feel like it's actually a real thing because I just like I'm alone I post it on the internet text comes back through the internet They're like that's not real like that doesn't feel like a real thing um, so yeah so that's so then after he died uh, is when I read The Widow's Son which would go on to become my favorite book like my favorite book of all time at the time I was working as a land surveyor um, oh, let's pull that up. There we go. Um, so I was working as a land surveyor, and I'm reading this book, and like I, you know, the uh, the field chief I worked with, like he liked to take a lot of breaks, <laughs> and so there would be a lot of me sitting in the truck getting to read books. Like I read Finnegan's Wake, I read Ulysses, I read The Widow's Son, and um, as I was going through all these books, and especially The Widow's Son. I realized that like land survey is like a deeply Masonic vocation. Like like look so it, uh, if you can see here like everything is it, it's a it's like a laser measurement system that sits on top of a pyramid. So an eye in the pyramid, and then it goes to that, which is like that reflects the laser back to measure distance. So again, it's an eye on the pyramid. Everything gets marked in those little triangles. Um, it's about construction. Like, I worked on construction sites. And it was just, like, this weird thing. I was like, I'm living a metaphor. And then you look into it, it's like, George Washington was a land surveyor. Like, all, like, Thomas Jefferson. Like, it's this huge, it was, like, it used to be this, like, noble profession that was, like, a big deal. And now it's just, you know, it's the, it's the assholes on the side of the road with the, with the little flags. And you're like, get out of the way. Um, so, yeah, so I, I and, and then the other thing that was, like, living a metaphor was one of the things that I worked at as a land surveyor was the, the landfill. The, 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 it's called Cherry Island in Delaware. It's, like, where all the trash goes. So I would measure the capacity of the landfill, which is, like, that's, that's some, like, you know, uh, like, alchemical metaphor in action right there, especially reading Finnegan's Wake, where the landfill is, like, the metaphor for history. And so you're, you know, where in the waste is the wisdom? Um, which, uh, I should say, uh, Finnegan's Wake and the Cantos were the things that he wanted to 
talk about. Like that's that's how we interacted. Uh, we interacted through mostly Joyce Pound and McLuhan, and like and that's that's why I was able to like have a back and forth with them because not everyone's willing to read that stuff. Like people, that's why people would bolt from the classes because they're like, I'm not reading Finnegan's Wake. Get out of here. And we're like, the Cantos is boring. I, I thought this was going to be fun. <laughs> you know, and people would bolt. But I was like, you know, I was happy to do it. So like that, that's part of like why we had a rapport was because I was willing to go into the, the Joyce and Pound and McLuhan and stuff. Um, and then so what, what so, so these, this is, this is just a, a thing that I drew as like a slice of life of like what my life was like at the time. And I posted it on my blog and I got a response and someone was like, um, are you a traveling man? And, uh, uh, and there was like, like all this cryptic stuff. And, uh, I looked it up and it was like some, it was basically someone asking me if I was a Mason, um, in like cryptic language because like, uh, I forget what it was. All the things I'm holding here are like ritual things and masonry. I'd never heard of it, any of it. But like, and then I looked it up. I was like, oh yeah, that is like all the stuff that you would think. So again, I'm like, I, I find myself again through selective attention, certainly, like living these worlds in a way that's really kind of bizarre. Um, so yeah. So uh, and then uh, I leave. Uh, so the the crash in 2008 happens and all of a sudden nobody needs land surveyors for a while so I uh, get a new job in Philadelphia working for a record company so I'm living in Philadelphia like right down the street from uh, like where all the like you know where Independence Hall is and City Hall and like and, and it's at the same time as all the Occupy Wall Street uh, protests are happening so like they're like I can hear it outside my window I'm right where all that stuff happens and I happen to be reading Nature's God and now Sigismundo is in Philadelphia and revolutionary shit's happening and he's trying to avoid it <laughs> and, and so I find I was like and it, uh, he's the exact same age as I am at the time that I'm reading it and so I'm like that's, that's kind of neat like I'm in Philadelphia like he is I'm the same age as he is and I'm reading the book and I'm like really enjoying it and I get an email from uh, New Falcon, and they're like, hey, do you want to do a cover and artwork for Nature's God? I'm like, fuck you, I'm reading that book, god damn it! <laughs> Leave me alone! <laughs> um, so, like, yeah, yeah, of course, yes, I do. Um, it, it, like, it, it was out of the blue, but I had done one previous cover for him, so it wasn't out of, it wasn't out of the question for me to do artwork for his books. But I had, but the fact that it was that one at that time was in fact a coincidence. And then so, it, <laughs> so it took, it took forever for the books to finally come out. It always does. Like it's always this thing where like you you pour your heart and soul into a project, and then it sits around for six months. And by the time it finally comes out, you don't even care about it anymore. <laughs> what was eight twenty three? Yeah, okay, yeah. So, and you may remember this because you blogged about it. Um, so the Earth will shake. I finally got like a release date, and it was finally because I've been sitting. I've done. I've done the best work I've ever done in my life, and it's sitting in a folder on my computer, and I can't show anyone because you know it's like there's. It's not even announced yet. It's like you know I sign non-disclosure agreements and all that stuff. So I have to sit on this stuff forever. I finally get uh, a publishing date for the Earth will shake, and <laughs> so I'm sitting in my office in Philadelphia oh, okay. and you know I've I, East Coast all my life all of a sudden the building starts shaking there was a little mini baby earthquake it was like two days after they had said like alright here's when it's going to come out you can go ahead and show people so it shakes I was like that's crazy and so I, I published the artwork for the earth will shake and I was like is this a bad time to plug the new cover for the earth will shake and now you know and obviously I can't help but point out look what the day it's a, August 23rd and 11 is the most magical of all right, right. So, yeah. and it's, it's the only earthquake I've ever experienced in my life and it was literally right after I got the okay to publish my art for the earth will shake so again it's a little bit I'm looking for coincidences but also like a little bit it's happening to me um, so I went on to do artwork for all three volumes and uh, it was it was the you know my favorite 
project I'd ever done. Um, it was, I put everything I possibly could into it. Um, I will say it's funny when, uh, when Nature's God first got published, I misspelled Chronicles on the cover <laughs> and they actually published a bunch. They were, <laughs> they, they weren't that mad. <laughs> I was like, well, you know, so, there's supposed to be other people checking this stuff too. Um, so I went on to do a bunch of book covers for Raw and even I got to do Leary stuff. And then, um, you know, uh, thankfully, Hilaritas Press, which is the uh, publishing imprint of the Raw Estate, got the rights back from New Falcon. And it, it, it's always weird for me because, like, I don't want to, like, New Falcon obviously did, like, not good stuff. But also they treated me very nicely, so it's like it's hard. I don't want to throw them under the bus too hard because they were nice to me. But then also like, fuck that because they were mean to other people, and it's like you can't stick up for people just because they were nice to you. So fuck them. But also I acknowledge that they were nice to me. If if you can if you if I can say both those things simultaneously, then I am. And if I can't, then I don't know. Um, so. So then, so they get the rights back for the book, but New Falcon won't give them the rights to my artwork. Um, so it's essentially like, you know, a, a waste. Until I got the idea that, hey, I could take that artwork, re switch it around a little bit, um, because the, the, the way that I signed my, I did my contracts, it was non-exclusive so long as it wasn't a part of those books. So what we did was we made a new book. Um, we called it Raw Art, and I took all the illustrations that I had done for New Falcon and all the stuff that I'd done just kind of along the way, and turned it into kind of like a cut-up comic zine thing. And so I, I thought that was a good way to like make use of of the material in a way that wasn't wasteful. And then, um, and, and and I should say like hilarious press and uh, like Christina and Rasa have been so awesome and like I love them they are they've been so good to me and they've been so good for like this material and just like the way they're handling everything I can't say enough uh, good things about them and so they asked me they said all right so we're, we're redoing the historical Luminatus Chronicles uh, do you want do you want to draw them again and I said no I do not because like I so I put everything I had into those, like I, I left it all out on the court, you know, like my, I was, I did everything, every trick I had to throw, I threw. So when they basically were like, all right, do it again. I was like, no, thank you. I, I was like, I, I, it would probably be better if you got like someone else, like I, I think it would be okay to get someone else's take on this stuff. Um, and, but they, they didn't like budge. They like, like they asked me. And I said no, and I didn't hear about it again for like six months. And they were like, are you sure? Come on, why don't you do it? And so then there was uh, Raw Day 2017, um, once again out in Santa Cruz. And I went and I, I like, so what I did actually, when they announced it, that's when I started putting together the Raw art book. And so like, I actually put that thing together. It was like two weeks of me putting that together. It was like a mad dash. And so I print them. I got them all published. I actually like the way I worked out the publishing was I sent it to a printing press that was next door to the event, so I could go and pick them up before the event. Um, and it was just it was it was such an awesome experience. Like I said before, like meeting these people in real life and it not just being like little pixels on a computer screen. I was like, all right, I'll, I can do it. Like I, I, I like I can. I you know it's been almost ten years. I should be able to come up with a way to to top myself which was i mean because like when you have like literally like you can I, what i was scared of was you can compare them illustration illustration but like you fucked that one up <laughs> you know like you know there was a good chance that i wasn't gonna be able to do it again um so i accepted it and uh i got to work and um so and now it's finally you know come out and so the, the, the earth well, Shake was kind of easy because it, each chapter has specific parameters. Each chapter is named after a tarot card. Each tarot card obviously refers to one of the characters in the book. So basically all you got to do is, you know, find a way to put those together. That's, it's basically like following a script. 
So the Earth will shake. The artwork was relatively easy. Have you, have you see this first can, one? Can you see this? Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. she doesn't have a convention membership, she can't get in and see that. Oh, well, gotcha. I mean, Julie, if you're hanging out after this talk with when you guys go get the registration, you can take my badge so you can go in and look at them if you want. Um, so, so what I, I I found a way to like you know instead of I would. I used the Crawley um, tarot cards a lot as inspiration because I had used the Rider White a lot for the first time around, and so I pulled a lot from, from Crowley stuff. Um, and if you can tell with this one, it's the Prometheus Rising pose. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, the one thing is I don't, I don't really recognize the Frida Harris or Crowley fool. Um, oh, no, it's not. That it's that not. That, that, not specifically for that one, but okay. like what, when, when I start a project like this, I like pull down so much reference material and I just see what I can grab. I'll and be super pedantic over this. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, yeah, and it's actually... Uh, the way I approach these kind of uh, adaptations is very similar to the land survey thing. Because the land survey thing has very... There's a very specific process for how you create new data points in relation to existing data points. Mm -hmm. And so you always... Like, you always have to... Um, check back in on the existing um, information, and so like a lot of this, it's like I always pull up every pos like every time Sigismundo has been drawn, I've like have that in a file on my computer. Like what did, what did the sword look like? If mm -hmm. if there's a good design for the sword somewhere, I'm going to use that instead of making up something of my own mm -hmm. because it like anchors into the existing textual framework. So that so I always try to like like the outfit he's wearing is the outfit he's wearing on the cover of the original books. Like I like I'm always trying to like invent as little as possible because I, I think it gives it like a verisimilitude of like this being a universe of ideas. And so I'm I'm, I'm trying to work with it as best I can. So these like I said these were easy to do. This was fun because. Um, I would start this in the morning, my kids would be over my shoulder and they would see the sketch, and by the time they got home from school, it would be mm. done. And um, so that, that, it was really, they, they would like come running through the door, like, oh, let me see, let me see. And, um, and I, uh, they, like, I use their eyes a lot for stuff. Like, if, 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 if the kids say something's, like, I don't like how this is, I always, like, they are, in a lot of ways, like, co-creators with all this stuff. I just, I really, I really trust their eye and their instincts. So a lot of this is like kind of co-created with them. Um, so yeah, so these, the payoff for these was easy in, in some ways. Um, some of it was a lot of hard work. I do, a, I do a, like a lot of these like little scritchy, scratchy lines. Um, some of it is computer generated, but most of it is my hand. I, I, I do an insane amount of cross hatching, like mm. to the point where I think I would, if someone was like, Eh, you, that's probably like an OCD thing. I'd probably have to be like, fair enough. Like, you know, that's uh, like I, 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 there's actual a pun on in the raw art. Raw art is a specific term meaning outsider art produced oh. because of neurosis. So I'm like, yeah, you know what? It, it, I'll, I'll wear that. That's fine. <laughs> um, this would be great stuff? as cards. I would love to. Have, oh, right on. Yeah, I would love to have cards with that. I think, yeah. Well, yeah, because I, I, I mean, they're designed as tarot yeah, cards, actually. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think mean, that, that would, would work. That would be a great novelty deck, you know. Um, this one I, I stole a little bit from the original. It was in, in uh, the, the, with him playing the piano. It was tiny in the original, and I really liked it, so I, I enlarged it. Is that, is that Mozart's Mozart? is sister? No, that's Sigismundo and uh, Maria. Okay. Oh, because see, Mozart, when he was young, toured Europe with his sister. His sister was also a very good piano player. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, but but that's ac that's actually Sigismundo, and that's Maria. You're correct. Yeah. And so, okay. And again, super pedantic. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so we were looking at that, and Tom was asking about the eye in it, and I'm okay. So in the thought deck, the devil card, it's associated with Zion, though, right? Not Ion. I'm not sure. Okay, because I'm pretty sure Ion is no pay is attached to the tower. Because okay. when he asked me what the eye in the triangle was, I saw the eye above the flames, and I was just like, oh, well, it's a reference to the tower. In, oh, in okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because you do have that. But so, okay, so, so since the tower is definitely pay, 
So it could be that the devil is I. Is that why you included yeah, the, the I? Right, I, right, okay, yeah. Because so I, of the Hebrew meaning, okay. Yeah, because the, the way I originally, I, I did it originally, like in the original drawing, there's just like a big devil up there. Mm, and then and, the two couples. And then the yeah. two couples. And so I, I thought it would be fun to do a version of like the devil that is more like the Lucifer aspect mm-hmm. of, the, of the devil. Like, like it, it's, it's an eye, it's like a sun, it's a star, because morning star. Like light thing, bringer, that sort of thing. I was looking at it and I was just like, it's very reminiscent of the tower from the Thoth Terra, but if it was like the devil from the Thoth Terra, it would need to look more like a penis. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Yeah, no, it was, it, like, it, it's, it's going, for, it's the morning star. Okay, it's like okay. that sort That's, of thing. I mean, it's and really it, neat. Yeah. And, and, and the idea of, like, kind of having a devil that isn't a monster, mm-hmm. um, and it's like, you know, just an aspect of our consciousness. And that is his drowned cousin, right? No, that is um, Babcock's... Ba- oh, okay. Yeah, because um, remember, his uh, his boyfriend drowns himself. Okay. And th- this is him... Oh, so this okay. this is him in a depression because his boyfriend has drowned himself. Oh, I feel so bad that I misinterpreted that so badly. Uh, no, well, I mean, it, it kind of works in, in both ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, and, and I think, I, probably the way he wrote it, I think that was supposed, supposed yeah. to be like a mirrored uh, theme. Um, but yeah, that's, that's Babcock depressed over his boyfriend. So then I hit the widow's son. And the widow's son, and the first time I drew it, was like the most like occult laden thi- like it was it was a magical working um in many ways and so i didn't know how to like again like i said i threw every trick i had at it so i didn't quite know how to do it and so i started um thinking about like how how would you like push the boundaries of art and I got to sort of like the MC Escher hyperspace kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so this was this was the first this is me cracking the case after days of, of hitting up against the brick wall. Um, cuz and one of the things about drawing like MC Escher is it's hard. <laughs> like you have to learn a lot about like, you know, three point perspective and vanishing points and it's it's like doing algebra in a way and it's not as the kids they come running home from school like What'd you do today? And I'm like, look at it. It's great. <laughs> like, Are you okay, Dad? <laughs> and I'm like, no, you don't understand. Um, so yeah, so so I decided to so like how the the Earth will shake was about characters. Um, the widow's son was going to be about space, mm-hmm. and so now we have characters that are in space, and so. Um, yeah, so that's what I did. So all of these are sort of like, this is the MC Escher stare thing. Um, this is like, you know, you have your impossible shape hair here. This is like a crazy three-point perspective thing. And all these lines are uh, done by hand. That's the Merovingian, um, like, sea monster That's thing. the Merovingian sea monster? Correct, yeah, okay. yeah. What book did you get that from, Bobby? Uh, I... D- I recognize it as something from an old um, it was, it was, demonology. Well, it was the, there was a couple of like when you search Merovingian, okay. um, it, it, they pull, it pulls up a bunch of like Renaissance era uh, artwork, and so it was pulled off one okay. of those. It's so, um, you know, another thing I tried to do is um, I try to keep the symbolism at the time of when the book takes place. Mm-hmm. So I like you know I try to. The only, like my art style is obviously like bound like twentieth century, twenty first mm-hmm. century, but um, a lot of the symbolism I try to keep in the era um, that the book's happening. Um, so yeah, so I, this was this was just me trying to bring my craft up to what I think is Raw's best book, and so he brought his best work. I thought I'd better bring mine. Um, there's another element. Uh, to to why I racked my head so hard over this that that I'll get to in a second, um, but yeah, but it was it was important to me that the artwork for this be noticeably better than anything I had drawn before. Um, so whereas the Earth will shake uh, artwork, you know, I did each of those in a, a you know like a normal working day. Uh, each of these was a, was a full week of of work. Like oh man, on this one, there is so much line that like each of these pillars every detail of it 
is drawn behind there, it's because you have to know where that brick is. Even though you can't see it, you have to know where it is so that that one's in the right spot. So like I would, one day I would, I would like to do an animation that, because I still have all the layers mm -hmm. in the, because these are drawn digitally. Um, I still have all the separate layers and I could actually take you through how the, how the algebra of how all this stuff works. Um, so yeah, um, and then uh, Nature's God w was again. It was it was fairly simple because there's there's you, you only get two. There's only two illustrations in that one, and there's enough going on in that book that it's pretty easy to pull out. I'm I'm, I'm particularly fond of this one because you know I, I pulled out a lot of you know there was a, there was a burgeoning graphic design scene going on at the time that the the book supposedly taken. Uh, place like these right here are Benjamin Franklin's original uh, the currency designs. These were meant to be. These were the original American currencies back there. Um, and these pillars with these two. I, I think it's uh, Liberty and I forget who the other one is. But uh, so all these designs are like uh, current with the time period the book's taking place. And so yeah, and then just like a group shot because I, it's been. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time with these characters, and so it was kind of fun just to do, like, a comic booky, like, you know, group shot. Um, so, and so th that's the artwork for this new series. So one of my favorite things is I get to share uh, space with Grant Morrison. I, it was fun to see my name on this, the same piece of artwork as his. Um, so here's, here's the other aspect of this. Into the Noid. Um... So, like I said, like whenever I, I do a book, I try to learn every single possible thing about it because, in my mind, the, you know, the sort of the meta contextuality of story, everything counts. Everything that's connected to the book is a part of the book, and so a big part of the widow's son is the Noid, <laughs> which you you know. So the Noid, you know, it's a very it was a very weird time in like marketing. I think we were like more naive as a culture, and we would more like readily accept marketing icons as pop culture icons, like the Where's the Beef ladies and like that sort of like grimace. And you know, like I had toys of the McDonald's mascots as a kid. I had my uh, pencil case had a sticker with the Where's the Beef lady. Like it was so. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the, the Noid, well, you know, he was one of those characters. He, like, he sort of transcended the, his, like, role as a uh, marketing mascot. And, uh, and so I, I like that from The Simpsons, avoid the Noid, he ruins pizzas, which is true. Or from 30 Rock, uh, when defining the word paranoid, uh, Jack Donaghy says, para from Latin meaning beside, and Noid, some sort of pizza demon. <laughs> Which, which is a good definition of what the Noid is. The Noid is a pizza demon. Uh, or, or Joyce's, in the bug, bug inning was the, the, the Woid. Um, all right, so, so the, the, the story is, on January 30th, 1989, 22-year-old Ken Lamar Noid, at about 11 a.m., entered a Domino's Pizza in Georgia with a 357 caliber Magnum revolver. Informing the facility to call the Domino's headquarters in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and tell them his demands. He was convinced that the Domino's company owner at the time, Tom S. Monahan, was... Hey, that's the same pronunciation that... Patricia Monaghan. Oh, yeah, but also, the, remember when I was asking how to pronounce the, the mud hen thing? Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, so he thought was, he was personally insulting and attacking him through the use of the obnoxious character of the same name and telling people to avoid him, also believing that Monaghan had been coming into his apartment to look around. Holding two employees hostage, Noid demanded $100,000, a getaway vehicle of, of a white limousine. Uh, some reports call that a helicopter. Helicopter is what um, I Yeah, but I, 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 the white limousine pops up more. I don't okay. even know where the... I, I've read a bunch of different clippings. I don't, I don't know where the helicopter came from. Um, and a copy of the science fiction novel, The Widow's Son. So in my head, when I'm doing the research for this thing, in my eyes, it's like, I gotta... This, you got to make it good enough to be worth this guy's obsession, you know? Like, it, 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 it's like, this is a part of the story. Um, <laughs> no Noid fired warning gunshots into the ceiling and floor throughout the incident. Like, he actually shot that gun off. Like, he didn't just go in there and, like, 
So anyway, five hours later, the employees had escaped uninjured after making two pizzas and possibly a salad for Noid, fleeing out the door while he ate. Minutes later, Noid surrendered to the police. Police Chief Reed Miller commented to the media, he's paranoid. And now, so, so this, this newspaper article kind of went like the uh, late 80s version of viral. It was mm-hmm. talked, on, it talked about on talk shows. And, you know, and, and everybody's take on this is to just like comment on the pun that his name is Noid and he was a paranoid schizophrenic. Like, so it's like Noid, paranoid, isn't that weird? That's it. Um, and so this is, this is what I uncovered just two days ago. This was not around just as recently as September. Um, so, and there's a detail in here that is very interesting. He said Noid offered to exchange a hostage for a copy of a science fiction book, The Widow's Son. But when a police officer brought the book, he reneged on his offer. They brought him the book. No one ever talked about that before. He actually, not only did he ask for it, but he got it. And, um, all right, so, so I, I thought that was it. No one ever mentioned that he got the book. And it's, it's, it's and part of the thing, well, uh, but any, uh, uh, before I get to that, so we have a picture of him, which I'd never seen before. Mm-hmm. I've never seen one. Never either. seen one. And then watch this. There's Sigismundo. Oh, my God. I mean, that's... Wow. I mean, you, there's no wonder, right? Like, he... And, and obviously the connection being, like, he thought he was in that book. And didn't I just spend an hour talking about how, like, I felt like I was wrapped up in this book? I, I Like, I get where this guy was at. I, I got a very... I got a gentler version of that, but like obviously he was like, "That's fucking me." And so uh, he spent several months in a mental institution, and he would later commit suicide on February twenty third, nineteen ninety five. Um, but look, he looks like kind of happy, and he ended up getting married and having two kids. So maybe it wasn't all bad. Maybe they were just like extreme episodes in between what was maybe otherwise an okay life. Um, but if it, so, like, you want to go back? His his daughter is named Maria. Yeah. Oh, how about that? That's a good pool. Wow. I'm sorry. This is just no, no. I had I, if I had noticed <laughs> that, I would have pointed it out. Um, so yeah. So so in every discussion about this, like I said, everyone just makes the noid paranoid joke and moves on. Like, oh, remember that funny character, and that's it. And I feel like this guy deserves us to ask why. Why did he ask for that book? Um, and I, there's a part in The Widow's Son where Sigismundo's, they don't call him this, but it's his, his schizophrenic cousin kills himself. And one of the big things in the book is uh, Sigismundo and Maria's brother spend way beyond a reasonable amount of time diving into the water where he drowned himself looking for him. And so I just, like, I felt like this guy deserved a couple of deep dives mm-hmm. after him. I, I, I think he, for, it, in a way, not only is he a part of this story, I mean, his story is almost more famous than the actual book. I'm sure more people have heard about this incident than have read The Widow's Son. So not only is he a part of the story, he's a big part of the story. And in my head, everything that's connected counts. And so, again, as someone who has had the experience of feeling like you're living in a Robert Anton Wilson novel, I just I felt like he, he deserved the question why. And so, so like it, a lot, of, it seems like a lot of people think of mental illness as this purely chaotic and random state of mind, completely untethered from meaning, and he would just as likely ask for a rubber ducky as the book. And so, why wonder about the book, right? He was, you know. He would have said anything. Uh, I didn't think of mental illness as a state of mind overwhelmed with meaning, but meaning of a personal subjective nature constructing using beliefs from outside of consensus reality. When done consciously, you get art, but when done unconsciously, you get illness. Obviously, if Noid got the money and the getaway vehicle, he could just buy the book for himself. So asking for it probably served some other purpose than just materially possessing the book, which is like when he got the book when he got what he asked for with the book, it, it wasn't enough. He's changed his mind. So I just sort of started to think, like, why ask for the book? So I was thinking, like, is it 
the Masonic signal of distress. He was clearly a person who was in distress. And in the book, it tells you that if you're in distress, you should say, oh, Lord, my God, is there no help for the widowed son? And I was wondering if this was sort of a way to, to ask that in a, in a big, bad way. And he did ask it in a big, bad way, because here we are, what is it, almost 30 years later, being like, I wonder about that. Um, and then it, there was another part that I was wondering if it was a signal flare from his own subconscious because the widow's son deals with mental illness in a very specific way, including ways how to overcome it. And I would imagine that's why the book was significant to him, because it probably provided him some relief from his illness. And so there is a quote in the widow's son, to believe that there is a gigantic conspiracy against you is the illness that drove Antonio to suicide. And that's he thought that there was this giant campaign against him that did eventually lead to a suicide. Like it, like he became embedded in this novel, but he got the Antonio role. He got the the, the one that, that didn't work out. Um, and yeah, so I um, and so then I, I and there's no I there's this is not. <laughs> I'm not saying anything about this guy. So this is the guy that he was having this battle with in his head, right? He's the owner of Domino's Pizza, the Detroit Tigers. I'm not saying anything about him. He, I'm sure he's a wonderful person. And there's no reason to suspect that Noid, uh, Noid knew anything about this. But it's thematically interesting, given the content of The Widow's Son, that Tom S. Monaghan is reputed to be a member of Opus Dei. And that a few years after the Noid incident, there was a movement to boycott Domino's because of Monaghan's alleged connections to an alleged Christian cult called the Word of God. Now, who knows where or why that came from, but that is a thing that's connected to that. Like I'm saying, like in this modeling of this stuff, everything that's connected counts. That's connected. It counts. This guy... Clear, like, does in fact fit the bill for the villains of the widow's son when seen in a certain light. Um, so that's that's interesting to me. Now, the name of the dweller in the abyss is Corinzon. That's like Crawley's description of that mental state that I was talking about when I fell into the burning ring of fire. And people get up tight sometimes, even when I talk about it. It's almost like like Voldemort, like uh, like Oz Fritz. I one time like was like don't talk about that stuff like to to talk about it is to invoke it in in, in a very w- way that was very much like Voldemort um it's not you know I you know I it's I Oz is a brilliant guy and I, but, I, but I don't happen to share that view of it um but Corinzon was my initial when I when I was in that phase where I was reading everything and looking 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 that was the f- reading Crowley's description of that was the first time I was like that dude saw the same thing I saw. That was my first, like, someone else, that someone else has seen it. Um, so that I held on to that. So then, like, okay, when I, when I was studying with Robert Anton Wilson, I looked exactly like that, <laughs> and he looked exactly like that. Um, uh, for the recording, it's, it's Harry Potter and Dumbledore. I know it's dumb. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I was when I was drawing my comics at night at the time. I was listening to those books on tape, which are very entertaining. Like it's, I don't know that there's anything deeper to it, but so I. But I feel like when you're when you're when you're that guy and you have access to that guy, it's your job to ask about that guy. So Harry Potter's job is to ask Dumbledore what's the deal with this Voldemort stuff, and so I asked Robert Anton Wilson what's the deal with this Quarantine shit, and he said that's oh, just Harvey. That's the Puka. And I was, and it, 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 I mean, look, like when I say that, that Robert Anton Wilson helped me when I came back from the Amazon and helped ground me, and this is what I'm talking about. This is, this is the difference. This is me no longer modeling that experience as a demon, and instead as a mischievous trickster god rabbit. And so when I asked him that question about uh, Coronzon, he sent me 40 pages of reference material on the puka. 40 pages just filled with everything he, he and even labeled it. Here's everything I know about Corinzon, a.k.a. Big Mouth, a.k.a. the puka. The Big Mouth thing is a story for another time. 
Um, so yeah, it really did help. And, and you know, if, if you'd like a definition of a puka, this is straight from the movie Harvey, and this tripped uh, Raw out because it seems to be talking to him. A uh, puka, puka from old Celtic mythology, a fairy spirit in animal form, always very large. The puka appears here and there, now and then, to this one and that one. A benign but mischievous creature, very fond of rum pots, crack pots, and how are you, Mr. Wilson? So this is, this is a way, again, like I was saying, about reintegrating uh, crazy experiences in a way that is um, healthier. Um, so, I mean, I, the Noid is a hookah, clearly. I mean, he's, he's some sort of mischievous humanoid rabbit. Um, I, I, I just, like, he, it is what it is. He is that thing. And here's the etymology of the word Noid. Sorcerer, wizard, witch, fairy. It's like it's there. It's baked into this like pop culture, mar- not even pop culture, like marketing of nonsense. Um, but there it is. So, so the puka. I was thinking about him. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, so there's this thing where there's the puka is a trickster god, and you have the Bugs Bunny side, but you also have the Frank from Donnie Darko side. These things have it's Corinzon and the puka. It's there's two sides to this stuff. Um, and so, so I, I mean, it's I, I got Bugs Bunny and, and, and Kenneth Lamar Noid got Frank. I, I, I think that's what happened. Um, and so when I met Robert Anton Wilson, when I, I went to his house and we got stoned and ate pizza and watched a Frankenstein movie, we watched a Son of Frankenstein. And uh, there was a part where one of the characters, I think it's Igor, says, uh, everything is under control. And... Uh, Mr. Wilson paused the TV, and so every, everything else, for the most part, up to then, and this was the interesting thing about meeting him, was he was just a nice old man. He wasn't in character. He was Bob. He wasn't Robert Anton Wilson. And it was, it was, it was, it was actually, it was what I preferred. It was like, that was, that was the illuminating thing, was that he was just a regular guy. He just, he could have been my neighbor. But then, in this one moment, he turned on the Merlin character. So he pauses the TV, and he looks over at me, and he goes, you know, everything really is under control. <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he did it in the character, and I, and I had this reaction simultaneously because that phrase kind of bifurcates. It's the basis for both paranoia and for, like, zen harmony. Everything's under control. This is not a test. Right, right. Like, is it? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> you know. Um, and so, yeah. And, um, and then this was this was the moment when I reintegrated. Um, this was uh, so. Uh, I asked him. I said, maybe recurrence and non-locality as two ways of modeling the same process. And that that, that he was like, yep, yep, that's it. So that was my. So in, in that experience with the, whether it was, you call it Harvey or Corinzon, it was, uh, it was uh, eternal recurrence. Things happening over and over and over again. And I realized that, like, oh, that's another way to model non-locality. It, it, it's, not, it, it's not that things are happening over and over again. It's... it's that at all times are simultaneous. It's, it's two different ways to model the same thing. And then, uh, I, so then I changed uh, my model. I said, oh, instead of modeling it like a circle, you can also model it like a spiral. And that was the difference. That was, that's how he helped guide me out of Chapel Perils. The Morgan Gaston High School built. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Today, tomorrow world. Yes, absolutely. So it, so basically is, uh, is it happening again, or is it always happening? And it depends on how you look at it. Um, and so then, uh, tomorrow is uh, living in a raw world. It, 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 it's like, you know, where, where you go from there, where you go from the fact that everything is under control, and that means terrible, amazing, awesome, wonderful, I don't know things. And where do you go from there? And that's my spiel. Good.